Hello and welcome. I'm Peter Afrasiabi, host of the Curious Lawyer series, and today's program, Zoo and Animal Law. Now, you see on our slide here, the Curious Lawyer's purpose is to give you access to different areas of legal education, perhaps subject matters that haven't intersected with your practice area. You can think of this as edutainment. It's a fun, interesting, educational walk down different areas of the law, areas you may be curious in. And so you can see we have done programs on CIA law, presidential pardon law, celebrity and paparazzi law. You can even learn sex, drugs, and rock and roll law and see how the realm of sex, drugs, and rock and roll intersect with different lifestyle areas and all the different intersections with the law. And we have the very popular Bill of Rights series programs. One hour for each of the first 10 amendments to the Constitution lets you become the total expert on the Bill of Rights next time you're at a cocktail party. And Yellowstone. Is there a perfect murder zone in Yellowstone? An area of the law which, because of the vicissitudes of the law, allows one to get away with crime? You're gonna have to watch that program to find the answer to that. But today's program is animal law. And we're looking primarily at zoos and animal welfare. So our legal topics that we're going to cover in today's program include the Animal Welfare Act of 1966, the Marine Mammal Protection Act of 1972, and the Big Cat Public Safety Act of 2023. We'll look at the federal standards that exist for the proper treatment of animals at zoos. We're gonna ask the question, are you allowed to pet big cats anymore? Could it actually be illegal to stroke a little baby tiger? We're gonna look at standing case law, and we're gonna see the breaks between some of the circuits in terms of whether and how animal rights groups can assert standing to challenge conditions that animals are subjected to in zoos and laboratories under the Animal Welfare Act. We will also look at state anti-cruelty laws, and we're going to look at the interplay of those state laws with our federal laws. We will look specifically at preemption of state animal cruelty laws. We're going to look at some fun, interesting questions. What about when the police enter your home to protect animals being abused, and the police enter without a warrant? Or what happens when a police officer sees an animal violating a leash law running around and then simply enters a home without a warrant to seize the dog for violating the leash law? Exigent circumstances, warrantless entries, does it apply to animals? You'll find out soon. We'll also look at the Supreme Court of the United States and a recent case it took up in 2023 looking at a California law that legislated how pigs and other animals need to be raised in order to sell pork in California and whether these laws can apply to out-of-state pork producers. Fascinating questions. We'll end by looking at Naruto the monkey. Can monkeys have copyrights? And there you see on our screen a picture of Naruto. That's a selfie he took. We're also going to look at Happy the Elephant. That's a picture of Happy the Elephant in, in the zoo in New York there. And the question we're going to ask about Happy is whether elephants can have liberty interests for purposes of habeas corpus petitions. It's been litigated. You're going to find out the answer. And, of course, because none of us have elephants and monkeys as pets, but we do have dogs, we're going to answer the question of whether the police can come and seize Toby the Beagle for running around without a leash. Let's get going. The Animal Welfare Act of 1966 is at 7 U.S.C. 2131. And so you can see here the key language from section 2131 on our page. The Congress finds that animals and activities which are regulated under this chapter are either in interstate or foreign commerce or substantially affect such commerce or the free flow thereof, and that regulation of animals and activities is provided is necessary to prevent and eliminate burdens upon commerce and to effectively regulate commerce. And so there's three things that they want to achieve here in this legislation from Congress. Number one, to ensure that animals intended for use in research or for exhibition purposes or for use as pets even are provided humane care and treatment. Number two, to assure the humane treatment of animals during transportation and commerce. And number three, to protect the owners of animals from the theft of their animals by preventing the sale or use of animals which have been stolen. Quote, the Congress further finds that it is essential to regulate, as provided in this chapter, the transportation, purchase, sale, housing, care, handling, and treatment of animals by carriers or by persons or organizations engaged in using them for research or exper experimental purposes or for exhibition purposes 
or holding them for sale as pets or for any purpose or use. So that's 2131. The question we have to ask is, what is the exact definition of an animal? Well, you can see it on our slide here. The term animal means any live or dead dog, cat, monkey, non-human primate mammal, guinea pig, hamster, rabbit, or such other warm-blooded animal as the secretary may determine as being used or intended for use for research, testing, experiments, or exhibition purposes, or as a pet. But such terms excludes birds, rats, mice, bred for use in research, horses not used for research, and other farm animals such as, but not limited to, livestock or poultry used or intended for use as food or fiber or livestock or poultry for improving animal nutrition, breeding, management, or production efficiency, or for improving the quality of food or fiber. Specifically with respect to a dog, the term means all dogs, including those used for hunting, security, or breeding. We get that from 2132. And the secretary that we're referring to here is the Secretary of Agriculture. Licensing requirement. Well, federal law spells out in section 2134 that no dealer or exhibitor shall sell or offer to sell or transport in commerce or to a research facility any pet, any animal, as defined, remember, including big cats, elephants, monkeys, you name it, warm-blooded mammals, or buy or sell or offer to transport them unless they've received a license and that license has not been suspended. So there is a fundamental licensing requirement before a zoo can even operate. What are the protections though? You're, let's assume you're a zoo, you've gone out and got your license, and now you want to show the world your, your beautiful animals in your zoo. Well, here's the sort of structure of how the protections exist. And this comes from section 2142 and 43 of the Animal Welfare Act. The executive branch is authorized to create humane standards and record keeping requirements as it relates to purchase, handling, or sale of animals. They're also authorized to require the licensing of those operators and the requirement of paying fees. Now, what are the standards, though, substantively that these requirements are going to engraft onto? Well, they're requirements that fit into two major categories, and you see it here in our second bullet point. It's categories A and B. A, we're talking about standards that get created and have been created by the executive branch that relate to the handling, housing, feeding, watering, sanitation, ventilation, shelter from extreme weather or temperatures, adequate veterinary care, and separation by species where it's found necessary for the humane handling, care, or treatment of them. And B, for exercise of dogs is determined by an attending vet in accordance with general standards promulgated by the secretary, and for a physical environment adequate to promote the psychological well-being of primates. So you see it's pretty all-encompassing. You gotta have a proper environment that creates the proper psychological well-being for these captive zoo creatures. We have to have protection from extreme weather, species separation at time, proper vent ventilation, housing, feeding, watering. It is actually incredibly humane. The standards created. Well, the United States Department of Agriculture subsequently issued regulations for primate dealers and exhibitors and the facilities that do research, including some mandatory requirements. And they also then required regulated parties to also themselves develop, document, and follow a proper plan for environmental enhancement adequate to promote the psychological well-being of non-human primates. And so there's three major categories you see in the regulations that have been enacted. And these regulations are at 9 CFR section 3.81. And you see them here on our slide. Social grouping, environmental enrichment, and restraint devices. So let's take them each in turn. Social grouping. This relates to the environment and enhancement plan that has to include specific provisions to address the social needs of non-human primates of species known to exist in social groups in nature. The second requirement, environmental enrichment. This relates to the physical environment in the primary enclosures that they must be enriched by providing means of expressing non-injurious species typical activities. This also explains why when we all go to zoos and we see, for example, the monkeys, the environment that the monkeys are kept in in the enclosures is species typical. 
the trees, the tall branches so they can swing, etc. You get it. Ditto for lions, ditto for elephants. Now the third category is restraint devices. Non-human primates must not be maintained in restraint devices unless it's required for a health reason. So by that, for example, if they're going to go and, you know, treat an injury or vac give a vaccine or medicine or something, that may require subduing and restraining the non-human primate, but it's only for purposes of health reasons. Now, there are also other exceptions, and that is specific, and this is that this is not to interfere with legitimate scientific inquiries or studies. And so you get this quote, which outlines this exception from a case coming from the Fourth Circuit in 1986, International Primate Protection League versus the Institute for Behavioral Research. It's reported at 799 F. Second 934, 940. And you see here the quote on our slide. One is a commitment to administrative supervision of animal welfare. The other is subordination of such supervision to the continued independence of research scientists. The Secretary's rulemaking authority does not extend to the design of experiments. The Secretary's enforcement authority does not extend to the confiscation of animals in use. In the words of Congress, under this bill, the research scientist still holds the key to the laboratory door. So in other words, Congress is and the Secretary are not there to by way of their rulemaking, create substantive standards on the type of research or how research must be done. If we're going to do research to find new vaccines or new drugs, those are within the, the realm of the scientists and subject to perhaps some other standards. But the AWA is not interfering when it's talking about proper environment, social setting and the like, when it comes to this kind of legitimate and licensed scientific research. Now on our next slide here, you can see that we're now talking about animal fighting. And 7 U.S.C. section 2156 of the Animal Welfare Act, subdivision F, addresses the illegality of animal fighting ventures. And so what it basically posits is that it's unlawful for people or businesses to run animal fighting ventures. And this includes any event in or affecting interstate or foreign commerce that involves a fight conducted or to be conducted between at least two animals for the purposes of sport, wagering, or entertainment. And shortly we'll look at a couple of cases and we'll see criminal prosecutions that have flown from those who engage in animal fighting ventures for profit. <clears throat> what happens if you do violate the AWA? Well, there's penalties. And so you see our penalties for violations slide here. The first one, $10,000 civil penalty per violation that can be assessed by the executive branch. There are also criminal penalties, which include up to a year in jail and fines. And the exclusive juris jurisdiction that exists to review any of the Secretary's rulings in this area, it lies in the Federal Courts of Appeal. And this is at Section 2149 of the Code. So let's take a look now and pivot from the statutory framework that we've looked at to see how some of these issues play out in litigation. And we're going to start by looking at the standing questions we talked about earlier. And you see on our slide here, we're looking at the case of Animal Legal Defense Fund versus Glickman. This is reported at 154 F3rd 426. It comes from the DC Circuit in 1998. It's an en banc decision. So let's look at the facts. Here we confront an animal advocate who visited a game farm nine times where he saw many animals, particularly primates, living in inhumane conditions. He repeatedly reported those inhumane con conditions to the USDA, which inspected the facility four times and found that it was in compliance with the regulations. So, in other words, the advocate was unhappy about the conditions, but the conditions met those that are outlined as we saw earlier in the regulatory framework established by the secretary. Nonetheless, the advocate stated his intention to continue visiting the game farm and then filed a lawsuit where he alleged that they had failed to adopt sufficient standards to protect the primate's psychological well-being as required by the Animal Welfare Act. And so the specific injury that was alleged was this injury to the plaintiff's aesthetic injury, an injury to his own aesthetic feelings, experience, and concerns as a zoo-going member of the public. 
And so the issue that made its way to the D.C. Circuit and to this en banc court is, does he have standing to assert his personal aesthetic injury to justify getting into the game, so to speak, to litigate the issue of whether the AWA was actually being complied with or whether the standards were not in compliance with the AWA's requirement to protect psych psychological well-being of primates. Well, here's what the court held in a split decision. The plaintiff had injury in fact standing as he loved animals, enjoyed touring zoos, and so he suffered injury in fact seeing those animals living in inhumane conditions. In other words, he had more than just an interest in seeing the law to be enforced. That is, it wasn't just about the law's not being followed, that bothers me, therefore I have standing. He had an actual, if you double click on that concern that obviously existed, he had a particular interest because of his deep background in zoos, attending zoos, and concern about animals. He wasn't just, for example, you or me who may go to a zoo once in a while. <clears throat> now, the plaintiff alleged that the conditions he saw would not have existed if proper regulations consistent with the AWA had been adopted. There was a dissent though, and the dissent said, look, aesthetic standing has to be limited to cases where the government action is actually risking the number of animals that are available for observation, not just the conditions that are purely subjective to a given plaintiff. But the plaintiff won there, and in that case, in that circuit at least, standing was found. We can also look here at a Ninth Circuit case, which is somewhat similar. This is Fun for Animals versus Lujan. It's reported at 962 F. 2nd, 1391. This comes out of the Ninth Circuit in 1992. And there you have plaintiffs alleging aesthetic injuries stemming from the mistreatment of bison who were being subjected to a population management plan that operated by shooting the bison who strayed out the, outside the boundaries of Yellowstone. Here's a quote from the Ninth Circuit that the fund's members had standing to sue because of the psychological injury they suffered from viewing the killing of bison in Montana. Plaintiff Mr. Pichel testified that several fund members had been emotionally harmed when they saw bison who were just standing outside the boundary of the park and crumbled to their feet. So that's another example of a case that found standing through the rubric of this idea of aesthetic injury. But let's pivot. <clears throat> and we're going to look now at no standing cases. And you see on our next slide here, the case of International Primate Protection League versus the Institute for Behavioral Research, reported at 799 F. 2nd, 934. This case comes out of the Fourth Circuit in 1986. Here are our facts in this case. Plaintiffs sued a private entity laboratory, claiming that the research laboratory was not maintaining laboratory animals in proper compliance with the AWA. Now the plaintiff had worked at various neurological studies um, of monkeys within the laboratory and claimed that in these laboratory studies, the neurological studies of the monkeys that were ongoing, the lab was not providing the monkeys with sufficient food or water or a sanitary environment or adequate veterinary care. And this is at page 936 of the opinion. And so this is a direct claim that like the prior cases we saw, the rubric of the AWA and the implementing regulations was simply not being followed by the lab. Here, however, it was held by the Fourth Circuit that the plaintiff argued that people having a personal interest in the preservation and encouragement of civilized and humane treatment of animals whose own aesthetic, conservational, or environmental interests are specifically and particularly offended, even along with their educational interests, will be detrimentally impacted. And so that was the framing of standing, very much like aesthetic injury, perhaps a little broader than aesthetic injury that we saw in those prior cases, because now we're also talking about educational injury in some sense. But the court here held that's too inchoate and does not confer standing. So we can see now that if you're taking the situation of aesthetic standing as applied to laboratories, perhaps not complying with the AWA, the courts are going to be stricter in terms of just saying, you don't have standing if they comply with the regula regulations that exist for the treatment of laboratory research purposes, you're out of luck. But on the other hand, if you're talking about bison in the wild or animals in a zoo, there's a greater ability for an individual, at least in some circuits, the ninth DC circuit, to establish aesthetic standing to ensure that the AWA standards are being met. 
Let's pivot now and we're going to talk about criminal indictments that flow from the violations of the EWA. And you see here on our criminal indictments slide, we're looking at the case of U.S. versus Hatfield. This is reported at 2023 U.S. District Lexus 78022. It comes out of the Eastern District of Kentucky in 2023. Here are the facts of our case of U.S. versus Mr. Hatfield, at all actually. So we had a situation where a group of defendants were indicted and they were indicted in Kentucky because they were running a chicken fighting wagering business. And basically what it was is, you know, people would come and pay money to watch these contests and then bet on which chicken would sort of kill the other chicken first in these chicken fighting things that, that people do sometimes. Now, the defendants once indicted in federal court said, hold on. We're simply doing something, in, in, in essence, in our backyard. You know, it's, it's me, my neighbors, friends, local community, whatnot. And this is simply intrastate commerce. And so any act of, the, of Congress in enacting the AWA as applied only to intrastate activities is simply void because we don't have interstate commerce here. And you remember, in our earlier slides in the beginning of this program, we saw the very express language that the AWA was expressly by Congress enacted pursuant to its power to regulate interstate commerce. It wasn't enacted pursuant to perhaps another power that Congress has, another grant of power under the Constitution to regulate other areas. Now, what the court held on these facts, at least, was that regular animal fighting ventures at Bald Rock, that was the location of, of the defendants, routinely drew participants from the Eastern District of Kentucky and other states and admission fees were collected from all the participants. And so what the court fundamentally held here is that people are coming not just from your neighborhood, but from other states as it was advertised to them, and you collected money from all of them, and that is interstate commerce, and so it was not an unconstitutional application of the law. The other side of the line, we don't have a case yet, but stay tuned in the future, because you can imagine a fact pattern where someone, for example, truly had something that was just being done in their backyard and literally not involving, you know, advertising, drawing in participants, they may make the same challenge and now you'll have a court double click on questions such as, okay, where did the animals come from? They probably traveled at some point in interstate commerce. Money is being used to wager, which is interstate commerce. And we have exceptionally broad concepts of interstate commerce, as we know from our Bill of Rights series, if you watch some of those programs. So, not a clear sense under the law that one could get away with avoiding a federal indictment by just inviting their neighbors over to do it. In other words, don't engage in animal fighting wagering ventures, please. <clears throat> now we're going to shift to elephants. And we're going to look at elephants in the Constitution. And we're going to answer the first of our really fun, curious lawyer questions. Can an elephant get a habeas petition? You see there the picture on our next slide of Happy the Elephant. And this is the case that's entitled Matter of Non-Human Rights versus Brahimi. And it's reported at 38 NY 3rd 555, and it's a 2020 decision coming out of the New York Court of Appeals. And of course, the New York Court of Appeals is the high court in New York. Here we have the facts. The plaintiff, Matter of Non-Human Rights, is an organization. And it wanted to establish that as a nonprofit charity, it's sort of business and focus as a 501c3 was that animals need protection and that they at least need some sort of non-human based animal protection equivalent to the protection that certain legal persons or all legal persons are entitled to. So in other, word, in other words, and this is to be specific, they weren't saying every non-human animal should be treated like a human. They had a more specific nuanced argument that Elephants, as non-human animals, are too close in myriad sort of factual ways to human beings such that they should actually be entitled to have certain legal rights. And so the plaintiff organization came in and said, that is our mission, our purpose, why we exist. The nature of our business is to sort of establish and prove this through science and, and, and the like. And then on behalf of Happy, they sought to file this action um, and filed a habeas corpus petition saying that Happy the Elephant 
was being subjected to what's fundamentally an illegal and in inhumane detention. Now, let's be clear. They were not arguing that the AWA or other state laws were violated. In other words, they weren't saying that Happy the Elephant was being kept in conditions by the zoo in New York that fell below the standard of AWA or perhaps fell below the standard of state laws. They were saying something actually very different, which is even if you comply with the AWA and a state law, Happy the Elephant should be the type of quote unquote person under the law who has the right to not be subjected to simply illegal detention, which of course all zoo animals in that sense are being subjected to detention without their consent. What did the New York High Court do? It held in a split decision, it's a 5-2 decision, the majority held that elephants were intelligent beings with autonomous behavior and intelligence patterns as opposed to reflexive thought behavior processes. So the majority agreed with that much that within the realm of non-human animals, they were at perhaps we could say a higher level of intelligence. They weren't just sort of reflexive in their response to stimulus and just reflexively responding. There was premeditated um, behavioral thought processes that demonstrated some level of autonomous intelligence, you know, decision-making processes, you know, I want to do X to achieve Y. That type of thinking pattern that we as humans have existed in the elephants. But the court held the nature of the habeas writ is only for human beings. And so non-human persons, so to speak, or non-human beings cannot be legal people for purposes of our habeas corpus constitutional laws to be able to go to court and get an order to terminate the detention. But I noted to you, there was a dissent. It was a 5-2 decision. Let's take a look at what the dissent said. And here on our next slide, we see the dissent. And here's a quote. The majority pays lip service to Happy's intelligence, her undisputed existence as an autonomous and extraordinarily cognitively complex being, and her legal entitlement to dignity and respect. And, and this is what's important for purposes of the legal analysis, habeas has long protected those not within legal precepts. The majority opinion, though knowing full well that the writ was vigorously used to, to challenge the detention of slaves when under law they were deemed chattel and to challenge the detention of women and children who at that time, though not chattel property, had no legal existence. So let's pause there. In other words, what the dissent was saying, the habeas writ has routinely be, been used to protect people who were not legal people. So the question of whether someone is a legal person is not the right question since we clearly have done it in the past and extended the habeas writ to people who were not defined as legal people. Elephants may not be legal people, therefore they should be applied. That's the syllogism. And here what they noted, particularly looking at the science of the, the genuinely remarkable intelligence of elephants, and I have to say, if you're at all interested and not familiar with this, it's an incredibly fun, interesting opinion to read, both for the habeas legal questions, but also because of the underlying science it, it, it dives into. And here we have a quick quote. As to elephants in particular, in 1957, scientists at a zoo in Germany conducted several experiments to determine the mental capabilities of elephants. The researchers found that elephants were able to recognize visual and auditory patterns, associate symbols with rewards and detriments, and anticipate consequences of their actions. Really fascinating case, but Happy the Elephant does not get habeas protection. Let's now pivot to the more recent and most recent word from our federal elected officials in the animal welfare area, and that is the Big Cat Public Safety Act of 2023. This act, as you see on our slide here, makes it unlawful to import, export, transport, sell, receive, acquire, purchase in commerce or in any manner substantially affecting commerce, or breed, or possess, quote, prohibited wildlife species, end quote. What does that mean? Lions, tigers, leopards, snow leopards, clouded leopards, jaguars, cheetahs, cheetahs, sorry, and cougars, or any hybrids of such animals, with certain exceptions, such as state universities, qualified zoos, etc. Now, this act also requires that any person who happened 
by December 22 to already own, you know, a baby lion or tiger. And you've all seen television shows about people who have tigers or lions as pets and whatnot, um, squeezing between all the laws that once existed in this area, um, the, the various state laws, that is. Well, as of December 22, Congress said, no more. If you got one, you have to come and register your animal not later than June 2023. Otherwise, it's illegal to own that cat. And if you don't own one, or if any of you watching didn't own one by December 2022, sorry, you don't get to go own a little cute baby tiger. Probably not a good idea to own it anyway, because it may grow up and eat you. Now, the other thing that's particularly interesting we see on our third bullet point here is that the act also makes it illegal to allow the public to pet these big cat cubs unless it's a trained vet, professional animal services, or conservation program, in which case those people in those programs can obviously pet and touch them. In other words, you can think of it simply. The old programs that may have existed where, you know, you know, really cute baby lions and tigers, we could go down and pet them at a certain zoo or a certain location in a certain state, no more. Congress has now essentially said no touching of big cats. And there are civil and criminal penalties for those who violate these laws. Now we're gonna shift. We've been talking about, of course, land mammals. We're now gonna look at marine mammals. And we're gonna look quickly at the Marine Mammal Protection Act of 1972. It came on the heels of the, the AWA in 1966. And this was to look at species in the ocean. And so this was enacted in acknowledgement of the fact that certain species and population stocks of marine mammals may be in danger of extinction or depletion as a result of our activities. And they need to be protected and encouraged to develop to the greatest extent feasible commensurate with sound policies of resource management. So it's looking to balance this idea of marine life also has to be protected, but at the same time we fish, we eat, you know, you know, salmon, tuna and the like, and so we have to sort of balance that. Bottom line is this act protects marine mammals from hunting, fishing, capturing, or killing. And the way it does it is through licensing provisions, obviously for fishermen, for certain types of species that can be gained, but not for other species. But it also outlaws taking. And you see on our slide here, taking is a statutory word. And basically the act generally prohibits any individual from taking a marine mammal. And it defines taking as harassing, hunting, capturing, killing, or attempting to harass, hunt, capture, or kill any marine mammal. This is why, for example, if you go down to the beach and you happen to see you know, a seal you know, out on a rock, you can't swim up there and get on the rock and try to pet or bother the seal because you're at that point harassing a mammal, you're violating federal law. That's why we leave our seals alone. It also allowed um, regulations to be implemented um, and required them to prohibit the doing of any further negligent or intentional acts that disturbs or molests marine mammals. And we have civil and criminal penalties for violations here. Now there are exceptions that we can look at a couple quickly here on our next slide and that is incidental to commercial fishing operations or other activities that have governmental approvals and approved scientific study or public dis display programs. In other words, we go to you know, aquatic zoos, so to, speak, so to speak, like SeaWorld or the like. Those are public dis display purposes. They get licenses. They can have those um, seals, whales, whatnot, be in there for those purposes. Um, or if an organization gets an approved scientific permit, and the incidental to commercial fishing exists because if a fisherman is out there, in essence, harvesting um, and fishing for salmon um, with a license and they happen to kill a seal, they're not going to be deemed per se in violation of the AWA. I'm sorry, of the Marine Mammal Act. So let's take a quick look at a case. And this is Center for Biological Diversity versus Salazar, 695 F3rd 893, coming out of the Ninth Circuit in 2012. And this basically is looking at oil and gas exploration and the interplay with um, polar bears. And we basically have a situation where there's a promising location to do oil and gas exploration, but it also happens to be home to polar bears um, and Pacific walruses. And those are mammals protected under the um, MMPA. Um, and so basically you have these polar bear stocks in Alaska with a population that was estimated of 3,500. And, you know, it used to be 200 to 250,000. So it's dropped substantially over time. And they migrate seasonally with the advance and retreat of sea ice. And that's the habitat they live on, of course. And the oil and gas industry for more than two decades had received incidental take authorizations for their exploration, development, production activities. And so that is 
They're doing legitimate licensed exploration activities for oil and gas, but they also need an incidental take authorization because in the process sometimes of engaging those act, um, activities, they may take, remember our definition of take a couple slides ago, on polar bears or um, Pacific walruses. And so they had received a series of regulations allowing this incidental taking of, of the two, um, of the polar bears and Pacific walruses over time. So we had plaintiffs who sued for a taking of those polar bears and walruses, um, and they basically argued that the taking's not negligible. And so the idea that there may be some incidental taking to lawful licensed activity is one thing under the law, but if it's no longer incidental, i.e. not negligible, it should be enjoined. So it goes to court and the Ninth Circuit held that the service doesn't have to quantify the number of marine mammals that would be taken. So this is not a mathematical thing such as if there are 5,000 alive and you take, you know, 50 of them, you've taken 1%, therefore that's too many or too little, whatever it may be. This is not a quantitative math formula. The question instead is, did the agency reasonably term, determine through some means that the activity being engaged in will result in the take of only small numbers. And how we calculate the small numbers, um, you know, can, it can be analyzed by the service in relation to the size of the population, um, so long as a neg negligible impact finding remains a distinct separate standard. So it's not gonna be a pure, pure math problem and it requires this idea of reasonable assessment of what are the small numbers as analyzed. And here, the government had analyzed a distinct standard in their rule and the Ninth Circuit upheld the rule um, as being appropriate and so the plaintiff was not able to enjoin that oil and gas exploration to protect the polar bears. So we're going to shift. We've looked at our three major federal laws in you know zoo and, <clears throat> and um, sea, sea animal life, but we're now going to look, as you see on our slide here, at the question of preemption of state animal cruelty laws. Do these federal statutes preempt whatever state laws exist? The answer is no. And prototypical case here, we picked one coming from North Carolina, Salzer versus King Kong Zoo. It's reported at 242 North Carolina Appellate 120, um, and this is 2015. And the court held that the AWA did not pre preempt state animal cruelty laws. And so plaintiffs there, they could sue a local zoo under the state law claiming that the animal conditions were substandard by state laws. So in other words, states may issue regulations that require more generous treatment of animals than the federal ones, and the federal ones don't control. They don't preempt the state's rights to regulate the protection of animals and the prevention of animal cruelty in their states. Which brings us to state cruelty laws. So let's take a look at a few different examples of some of our state cruelty laws as they apply to our wildlife and zoo animals, the types of animals that end up in zoos, including our own pet animals. And we have different states have different definitions of covered animals. And the big picture that we can understand here is that some states exempt zoos from all state laws. Some have incredibly broad laws that apply to all living creatures except humans. So it goes beyond even the scope of you know, mammals under the AWA, warm-blooded mammals, it would cover everything. And we're gonna take a look um, at a couple states. We'll look at California and give a California example and some California litigation that's occurred um, here. So let's take a look at California Penal Code 597. A person who maliciously and intentionally maims, mutilates, tortures, or wounds a living animal and bird, mammal, reptile, amphibian, or fish, or maliciously and intentionally kills an animal is guilty of a crime. And if you overdrive, overload, drive and overload, overwork, torture, torment, um, deprive of sustenance, drink or shelter, beat, mutilate or kill an animal or cause or procure an animal to be treated in such ways, that too can make you guilty of a crime under California Penal Code 597. So you can see California is an example of a pretty broad law that covers and protects from mistreatment, a broader range of animals than the AWA was looking at. So let's take a look at some case law now. And so first we're gonna look at the case of People v. Dunn on our next slide here. And this is a prosecution under Penal Code 597A. Um, and here we have a situation where the court held that to maliciously maim or kill another person's animal, it was perfectly fair to instruct the jury that the defendant who had gone and killed someone else's animal, and this is a situation where the defendant killed an animal that strayed onto the defendant's land. Well, the 
jury was perfectly well to be instructed that the defendant's proper remedy when they saw an animal illegally trespassing on their land was to drive the animal off or confine the animal and ultimately get the animal back to the owner and go sue the owner for damages to the land or the crops or whatever the expense that you've had to keep that animal that the owner didn't protect or keep from trespassing on your property. Um, but to go out and shoot it, not okay. You can be criminally prosecuted under Penal Code 597. That's People v. Dunn, 39 Cal App, 3rd, 418, and that's from 1974. We'll look at a slightly more recent case, 2001, People v. Youngblood at 91 Cal App, 4th, 66. Here we had a woman who had 92 cats in her trailer. She's indicted under the statute, and it was found that, yes, she can be convicted and found guilty under this statute for animal cruelty where her 92 cats in her trailer were being deprived of the necessary sustenance of both food or water and subjected them to needless suffering. And that's an example for, you know, for example of a situation where just simply a volume of pets that's too great to allow you to even properly feed or water them, even if you start from a position of loving your, loving your cats and wanting to have lots of cats to protect them, it can actually put these animals in a situation of needless suffering and can find you being convicted under 597. Now we're going to turn to look at warrantless searches of houses and animal cruelty. And the cool question here is, we think about the Fourth Amendment all the time in terms of the police coming into our property. You know, do they go get a warrant to come in or do they sometimes have ex exigent circumstances because they have to protect the public and the public safety, right? Someone may be beating someone up in the house or have a gun and shooting, don't have time to get a warrant, have to go in, protect human beings. What about protecting animals? Well, here we have People versus Chung, 185 Calip 4th, 247 in 2010, and here's our facts. Neighbor in an apartment building called the police and said they could hear dogs crying in the unit above. So the police go out to the apartment. The owner, Mr. Chung, says, I don't own any dogs. But then the police heard whimpering at the door. The police believed there's an animal in distress in there. So they entered and searched. They didn't go get a warrant. They just entered on the spot. And what did they find? It's pretty grim. They found a dead dog in the freezer and an injured dying dog on the balcony. And the frozen dog in the freezer, you could see, had been beaten to death. And the dog on the balcony had serious head trauma. So they arrested Mr. Chung. Mr. Chung's prosecuted. Mr. Chung argues um, that all of this evidence should be excluded because there was no warrant. The search is illegal. Fruit of the poisonous tree and all that. If you've watched our Bill of Rights Fourth Amendment series, you would know all that. But in any event, the question then was, well, what about exigent circumstances to protect the animals? And what the California court held is that Animal cruelty violates the law, and so the exigent circumstances doctrine on warrantless searches can apply to dispense the warrant requirement when one's goal is to protect animals. It's not just limited to protecting people. Now let's look at the other side of this where warrantless searches perhaps have gone too far. Here we have a case coming out of Pasadena, Conway versus Pasadena Humane Society, 41 Calop 4th, 167 in 1996, and this is Toby the Beagle. So, some police in Pasadena, they saw a dog, Toby, roaming the streets. They actually recognized Toby as belonging to the Conway family. And they saw Toby running around, no leash on, on his own. <clears throat> but they also saw Toby return to the Conway property. So the police went to the home and they knocked. No one's home. No answer. They went around back and they saw the back door was open. So they went into the home. And then they went into a bedroom and they found Toby having a good time lying on the bed sleeping. What did the police do? They seized Toby. Why? He was running at large without a leash. Was the warrantless search okay here? And this time we have a warrantless seizure too? No, it wasn't. What the California Court of Appeal held is that the dog Toby was not posing a danger to anyone. And so there was no basis to justify dispensing with the warrant requirement. And so the entry and seizure of the dog could not be blessed under the Fourth Amendment. Makes sense. All right, let's look now at California's Proposition 12. It's a recent animal cruelty law, and this went up to the, Cal to the United States Supreme Court. And here's the basic law. Hens, mother pigs, and calves raised for veal in California cannot be cruelly confined. And cruel was defined to be if an animal can't lie down, stand up, or fully extend its limbs, it's being held in cruel treatment. California now imports almost all of its pork. So this law, in terms of the costs of how the animals are maintained, was fundamentally being borne by out-of-state producers 
and also California consumers through pricing, of course. So the pork industry challenged the law as unconstitutional because it was interfering with interstate commerce. The Ninth Circuit said this law is valid and does not interfere with something Congress has already legislated exclusively on. But it went to the United States Supreme Court and let's see what the United States Supreme Court does. We're gonna listen real briefly here to about four and a half minutes of oral argument. So listen to this. We'll hear argument first this morning in case 21468, National Pork Producers versus Ross. Mr. Bishop. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. The facts we allege are assumed to be true for purposes of decision here. They state a claim that Proposition 12 violates the Commerce Clause almost per se because it's an extraterritorial regulation that conditions pork sales on out-of-state farmers adopting California's preferred farming methods for no valid safety reason. Proposition 12 also fails the Pike test because it burdens interstate commerce for no local benefit. California wants to change farming methods everywhere to, quote, prevent animal cruelty by phasing out extreme methods of farm animal confinement. That confinement occurs in other states. California imports 99.9% of its pork. Decisions like Baldwin establish that even when a law is triggered only by in-state sales, a state may not project its legislation into other states in that way. To do so infringes the territorial autonomy of sister states, and it impedes our national common market. No other state makes its farmers house pigs the way that California does, and very few farmers do. They keep sows in individual pens during the vulnerable breeding period, and they provide less than 24 square feet of space in group pens. An Iowa farmer doesn't know where pork from his sows will be sold. Pigs go to a nursery, a finisher, then a slaughterhouse where the packer butchers them into parts that are sold around the world in response to demand. The only safe course is to raise all pigs the California way, which is what we see buyers demanding. And the cost of doing that in here in pork parts sold in places where buyers are unwilling to pay more to satisfy California's policy preferences. If Proposition 12 is lawful, New York can say that pigs have to have 26 feet of space and and send uh, inspectors into farms to police compliance as California does. Oregon can condition imports on workers being paid the minimum wage, and Texas can condition sales on the producer employing only lawful U.S. residents. And at that point, we have truly abandoned the framers' idea of a national market. I invite the Court's questions. <clears throat> Mr. Bishop, um, when exactly is uh, a state, intrastate regulation impermissibly extraterritorial? Well, uh, it, because this, as I read California's law, it is about products being sold in California. Uh, unlike some of the cases you cite, it's not reaching out and regulating something across state line or regulating prices. Well, the test that we uh, propose is that a state law that conditions sales on an out-of-state business uh, operating in a particular way. And how does California exactly do that? uh, You cannot sell pork in California unless you raise your sows in a particular way um, out of state. It's a condition on sale. That's very little different from Baldwin. Baldwin conditioned the sale of milk in New York predicated on the um, Vermont producer being paid the New York rate. And it did that uh, because it thought that it was necessary to pay Vermont farmers that much in order for them to use sanitary methods on the dairy. This but, court held but, that New well, York what did if, not what, project its legislation that way. But what if, what if California – I'm sorry to interrupt you. I oh, apologize. Uh, what if California said a house has to be built according to certain rules by certain standards with certain products, hence uh, excluding products that are made in another state? For example, it says that you can't build a house entirely out of wood, so you, you can't import wood from another state like that's a lumber state like Georgia. That, that's, that's different, Justice Thomas. Why we, is we it? Have, I mean, it's affecting, it's affecting your product from your, from, uh, extraterritorially. No, a state may ban a product, 
there's no doubt about that. It could ban pork. It can ban lumber uh, to be used in building houses. What it can't do is condition sales in the state on a business in another state adopting uh, particular methods of production. That tramples on the other state's rights. All right. So you heard the oral argument. 9-0, the law was valid. Basically, what the U.S. Supreme Court held is that companies that choose to sell products in various states have got to always comply with the laws of those various states. And so the idea of using the Dormant Commerce Clause to back-end the idea that there's discrimination against out-of-state economic interests isn't true, um, and that's just the way it is. And so the Constitution may well address weighty issues, they said, but the type of pork chops California merchants may sell is not on that list. Let's shift. We've looked a lot at California laws in terms of how they interplay with warrant requirements, with commercial regulations, but now we're going to pivot really quickly to Louisiana. And we'll look at Louisiana HB 1621. And this is another prototypical type of law looking to address a different issue that the people of Louisiana were confronting. Here we had a state law that makes it illegal to kill a current or former zoo or circus animal for sport. This law prohibits zoos and circuses from providing, selling, or donating any animal for use in hunts where hunters would then pay fees to kill those formerly captive tame animals. And basically, this is being passed and this came into existence because zoos and circuses, I guess, had a bunch of animals that were getting older. They didn't want them. They didn't know what to do with them. And it turned out that a whole bunch of enterprising commercial people out there had built businesses around getting these former lions or whatnot from zoos, putting them out into some into some sort of probably fenced in very, very large space, and then, you know, having hunters pay a bunch of money to be able to, to, to be able to go out and, you know, kill the former zoo lion. In any event, illegal in Louisiana. We're now going to look at monkeys and copyrights. And this is the case of Naruto versus Slater. It's reported at 888F3-418. It comes from the Ninth Circuit in 2018. And there you see a picture of Naruto the monkey. He's an Indonesian macaw monkey. And that's a selfie that Naruto actually took himself. And basically what happened in this case is that there's a cameraman photographer, a guy by the name of Slater, and he left his camera unattended. And Naruto then picked up the camera, turned it around, snapped a photo of himself. And you can see he's there. There's some debate as to whether he's smiling or actually that's a sort of um, a face that the macaw monkeys make that we interpret as a smile, but it's actually them being very, very angry. But whether cute little Naruto is smiling or getting ready to kill someone, we don't know. But that's Naruto in any event snapped a pretty cool selfie. Now, Slater found this on his camera and Slater said, I like this photo. It's kind of amazing. And he took it himself. So he published the photo, registered a copyright in it, which you can do under the Copyright Act, and which, footnote for those of you who may represent people who traffic in content such as photographs, writings, other things that could fall under the Copyright Act, if you want to ever sue someone for infringement of that copyright in federal court, which is where exclusive jurisdiction for copyright is, you must register the copyright to be able to even go to court. So practice pointer for those of you with those types of clients. If you got content that you think may be valuable, it's worth paying the very, very small fee to the Copyright Office to register it. And if you register it before people infringe, then you can get access to massive statutory damages, up to $150,000 for a willful infringement, even if the um, market value of the photo may, of course, be far, far less. So in any event, little side um, side note there, practice pointer in terms of the importance of registering copyrights. Back to Mr. Slater and Naruto the monkey. Um, Slater registered this copyright and claimed a copyright in it. And what we had now was that we see the plaintiff Naruto, it was um, PETA, the People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. They sued on behalf of Naruto. And what they said is that Slater doesn't get to exploit the copyright. Slater's out making money, claiming that the copyright belongs to him. He can't do that because Naruto was the author of the photo. This raises the question under the Copyright Act about authorship. Who is an author under the Copyright Act? Well, 
The author is the person that creates the content. If I take a photo of you, I'm the one taking the photo, setting the lighting, the angle, and all that. I am the author. You, the subject of the photo, are not the author. If I write a poem, I'm the author. If I create a movie, I'm the author. So they go to court and they say on behalf of Naruto that Naruto's the author, and so that copyright's not valid for Mr. Slater. Mr. Slater should, has been collecting ill-gotten gains, and we need an injunction. Um, we need perhaps money, not sure where the, how the money would get to Naruto or maybe it would go to um, the people for the ethical treatment of animals. But in any event, this goes to court. And it winds its way up to the Ninth Circuit and the Ninth Circuit holds that a monkey selfie cannot belong to the monkey as the author because an author has to be a human author under the Copyright Act. And so this is an example, like we saw Happy the Elephant not being a person for purposes of liberty interests for habeas law. Here we're looking at copyright law and similar requirement that authorship and personhood in terms of who can be an author under our Copyright Act is limited to the realm of human beings. Much like Happy the Elephant couldn't be defined to be a person for purposes of habeas law, Naruto the monkey couldn't be a person for purposes of copyright law. And so Slater won, Naruto the monkey, or technically the people for the ethical treatment of animals lost. <clears throat> but it gets worse because the court held that the people for the ethical treatment of animals owed attorney's fees to Slater. <clears throat> now, as a little aside here, we can think about the fascinating implications of this case in this radical new world we're in of artificial intelligence and copyrights and authorship. If only people can be authors, what happens when we have artificial intelligence machines that have self-learned on a body of information and data and just self-create something? Who's the author of it? If it can only be a human, the AI is not a human, obviously. Are we going to amend the copyright laws to say that AI is human? Or are we going to say that the AI, regardless of how smart machine learning may become, at the end of the day, there was a human being, a corporation ultimately, right, that created the code that gave rise to the AI, and maybe we will say that it all belongs to the corporation ultimately as being the author. Stay tuned, and if you want to learn about that, you can watch programs that we have done in the Curious Lawyer series on the metaverse and on artificial intelligence and intellectual property law and these fascinating new cases that are really proceeding at breathtaking speed and challenging our legal regimes to sort of adapt and address modern legal technology. This brings us to the end of our program and our conclusions. And so we saw multiple federal laws that we have that exist to protect zoo and marine animals with pretty broad definitions between the two acts, the Marine Mammal Protection Act and the Animal Welfare Act, we saw pretty broad coverage for most animals. And we saw a third statute, that's the 2023 Big Cat Act, that's protecting specifically one little narrow vertical coming out of um, that ra those range of animals in terms of how we treat our big cats. Those laws create the framework that exists and that explains why when we all walk into our local zoos, we see the animals we do, and it gives us some sense of what is going on behind the scenes in terms of the treatment of those animals and how they're being maintained, why the very environments we see them in exist in that way because of our legal regimes. We also have learned about state anti-cruelty laws and how those have not been preempted. And so we've seen some pretty broad state statutes from California and Louisiana that are focusing on conduct that our federal statutes don't focus on, conduct which can lead to significant criminal penalties for violations, whether it's hunting and killing former zoo animals or it's abusing, mistreating, overworking in unfair or inappropriate conditions, a whole range of animals in California. Those anti-cruelty laws are real, they exist, and people go to jail for violating them. We saw the fun questions about monkeys and elephants and the intersection with our other legal regimes. And it turns out monkeys can't get copyrights today, 
Maybe when the artificial intelligence technology challenges our legal regime, the definition of a person will get broader and we can revisit whether Naruto can have a copyright. Stay tuned. And we also saw elephants. Happy the elephant, unfortunately, could not get habeas rights um, coming out of the New York court. But we also saw it's not a slam dunk question. It was a split decision with two of the seven highest court judges in New York saying no, that Happy the Elephant should be entitled to habeas rights given the proper reading of um, habeas law and how we protect people. We saw warrantless entry and seizures of sleeping dogs for running without a leash. That's unconstitutional. If you're watching from state law enforcement, the DA's office or, or whatnot anywhere in the country, tell your police to please go get a warrant if they're gonna go take a sleeping dog off a bed. Seems self-evident, but there you go. By the same token, if dogs are being abused or pets are being abused and they hear the type of evidence that gives rise to the belief that the dog's in imminent danger, the warrant requirement can be dispensed with and exigent circumstances can apply to allow the entry into one's home to protect those animals. That's it for today. If you want to see our other Curious Lawyer programs, go check them all out for a fun, educational, entertaining walk down a different area of the law you may not have seen before. And as always, if you have any questions, please email me. Thank you.